Okay, welcome back, folks. Been gone for a couple of weeks. I hope you all had a good uh, Christmas and New Year's Day. Um, we have been talking about the Ozarks, and I was just telling uh, Katrina that we only have just a few weeks left of this. Uh, so probably we ought to be done with this around the end of February, somewhere in that area through there. And then we'll be starting a whole new series. And I'll be talking more about that a little bit later. I think you'll be interested in it, some of you. Uh, we've been talking the last couple of weeks when I was with you about the railroad in the Ozarks. I kind of mentioned in the beginning that there were three economic anchors of the Ozarks economy uh, that really brought it to the forefront. And the obvious first one was the railroad. It was so important as it was throughout the nation, but it was very important to the Ozarks because we were so remote and so rugged uh, that, you know, people could not get from here to there very easily. And so the railroad kind of opened up the Ozarks. In the process, it opened up another couple of economic anchors. And that's what we're going to be talking about today and next week, those two other economic anchors. What we're going to be talking about today is the timber industry. Now, I'll bet you there's some of you out there that know a little bit about your family history. I bet that you've got some uh, tie hackers. And if you don't know what a tie hacker is, that's a person that hewed a railroad tie out of a log. And there were just thousands of people in the Ozarks in the 1800s and early 1900s that could make a, a reasonable, decent living for that time out of going out into the woods and chopping down trees and making railroad ties out of them. And that's what we're going to be talking about a lot today. In fact, I've got a really, really neat little film that I'm going to show you that was made back in the early 1900s. And I love it. And I'll, I'll kind of explain it to you when we get there because it shows the whole process of the timber industry. And uh, it's so neat because it shows you some of these, it, it shows you actually old time Ozarkers working the land. And, you know, I can tell you about it all day long. It's so much more interesting when you can see it. So we're going to talk about today about the timber industry. Now, my Ozarker of the day, I'm going to guess that there's not anybody out there who's going to recognize this guy. And yet he is so important to the conservation of this state. His name is Leo Dre, D-R-E-Y. And Leo passed away a few years back at the young age of 98 years old. Uh, very interesting man. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Leo Dre. He, uh, he made... A good living. He inherited some money of his own, went into the military, came back out as an engineer, and he absolutely loved the land of the Ozarks. Uh, he was up in the St. Louis area, but he loved to come down to the Ozarks and, and just hike and travel. And so he started buying up land uh, as land would go for sale, particularly after the Great Depression. It was selling pretty cheap. He would buy it up and by the time he got done, he had accumulated close to 200,000 acres of land in the Ozarks. That's a lot of land, folks. He was the single largest landowner in the state of Missouri. Uh, and here's the thing. He didn't buy it up to develop it. He didn't buy it up to put houses or commercial buildings on it. He didn't even buy it up to farm it. He bought it up to preserve it. He wanted to preserve the land. And so when he got done, he ended up donating almost every bit of it to the state and to the federal government. He didn't sell any of it off. He gave it all away as long as it was preserved. And that was the conditions he gave. He said, as long as you make state parks out of it or, or refuges or something. And today there are hundreds of thousands of acres of land preserved in the Ozarks due to this man right here. He is one of the giants in the conservation uh, movement in the state of Missouri. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the conservation department here towards the end of this, because it's uh, it's really important to this whole concept of the timber industry. But a really, a really, really important man. Uh, that's him again as a young man. 
uh, looking over some trees, over some land that he donated to the state. So let's look at the timber industry and what it had to do. Now, you know, the railroad industry, uh, you had to have a certain amount of skill or you had to live presumably somewhat near a town uh, in order to work with the railroad industry. If you uh, wanted to work in timber, all you had to do was walk outside your cabin with an ax and you could do something with timber because there were just tons. I mean, it was, you know, the, the Ozarks were covered with timber for the most part. And so it was a really easy way to make a living. And again, just I can't even begin to estimate how many people got into the timber industry in the Ozarks. And uh, it all started around the Gasconade River in the early 1800s, up around Fort Leonard Wood and Waynesville in that area. And uh, they began to, uh, you know, cut down the hardwood forest of the oak and hickory trees. They were just abundant. And people thought, you know, you never could cut them all down. People thought it was just, uh, you know, back in these days, there were so much of it and so few people that people thought, you know, there's, this stuff will last forever. Well, it didn't last forever. In fact, the case we just about destroyed the timber industry in the state of Missouri. Luckily, which it's come back because due to conservation efforts, due to people like Leo Dre, um, we have a lot of timber left now. Uh, of course, the timber was used for various things. It was used for home construction, primarily in St. Louis, somewhat in Kansas City, but mostly in St. Louis and the areas like this were growing so rapidly. And there was such a need for, for lumber that it was uh, used for that. And of course, the big one was the railroad ties. Remember, the railroad is just going crazy in the late 1800s and early 1900s in the Ozarks. And, you know, just thousands of thousands, millions probably of railroad ties were needed. And we're better to get them right here in the Ozarks out of their hickory and their oak trees. Uh, and so that's where they came from. And of course, fuel. A lot of people were, were heating with wood still do folks you go down into the you know the remote rugged areas of the ozarks and you go by every house and i guarantee you you see smoke coming out of the chimney from their fireplace you know from their wood stoves uh, so it's it you know it was used for that uh here's a really good picture of some ozarkers during this period of time uh working at what's called uh tie hacking you can see the railroad tie there they're hacking out uh, from a log, and uh, it was hard, laborious work, folks. I mean, I'm telling you, it took it. It was a lot of effort. Um, part of this led to the creation of what we would call timber towns, boom towns. Um, as the Frisco Railroad grew, they would create little spurs that would go down, and uh, to certain towns. And uh, one of the most famous of this was the town of Chadwick. And remember, we talked about Chadwick and we talked about the bald knobbers, the vigilante group, that uh, Chadwick was down in the very southern part of Christian County, right at the northern edge of Taney County. And they were, uh, it was just like a, a boom town. And, uh, you know, some of the other ones, Donovan in the southeastern part, Eminence, Birch Tree, Sparta, Hollister, Chadwick, all these were just towns that started up because of the timber industry. And, uh, you know, there were, there were a lot of these. Just like the railroad started lots of towns, so did the timber industry start a lot of towns. And, and they were pretty rugged, folks. I mean, I'm telling you, life in these little timber towns were pretty tough. Um, one of the nicknames for Chadwick was Hell's Half Acre. <laughs> you know, it was, a, it was a rough little town. And, uh, you know, if you wanted to live there back in these days, you had to be pretty tough. Here's a picture of uh, South Chadwick in the early 1900s. And, um, you know, it uh, probably doesn't look a lot different today. I'll be honest, Chadwick's, a, you know, it's not a really big metropolis, to say the least. But uh, it was a rough little town back in these days. So how did this logging industry, what was the procedure for it? Well, most of them, uh, involved a sawmill, and most of these saws mill were, were two-man sawmills. Uh, you know, it was, they weren't big enterprises for the most part. Some of them were actually kind of portable. You could move them around. Um, 
the early ones were run by animals. You know, they had animals that would, you know, uh, turn the, the gears and things like this. Of course, as the steam steam engines came along, they all converted real rapidly to steam engines. By the way, if you're uh, if you happen to be in the Springfield area, and you happen to be interested in this kind of thing, every September, in the little town of Republic, about two miles from where I'm sitting, they have something called the Steamarama, and people from all over the country, I mean, literally thousands of miles away, come to Republic in usually the second or third weekend in September, and they bring with them their steam engines, and it's a steam engine show, and it is so neat. Uh, I've been there several times, and it is just remarkable to see these things. They operate them. They actually have sawmills set up. They have locomotives. I mean, they have all the farm implements that were made out of steam engines, and it is such a neat thing. You know, people that are into this really do a good job with it. And so if you happen to be in the Springfield area around the second or third week in September, uh, it's out on Highway 60, right where you get into Republic, uh, west of Springfield. It's a really neat thing, but it uh, it shows you all these uh, steam engine uh, industry that was going on that operated these sawmills and not just sawmills, but like I said, uh, all the agricultural implements, everything. Uh, most of them, like I said, were steam powered. Eventually, when electricity came to the Ozarks in the 1920s and 30s, um, they began to convert over to electrical power. But again, uh, kind of hard because that required a lot of electricity and it wasn't very uh, economically sound at that time. So the operation included the following steps, and I'm going to show you some pictures of this in a minute. Uh, first of all, obviously, you had to clear the logs. And they always cleared the logs next to a river first because that was how you usually got the logs down to the sawmill or a railroad was you floated them down a river. You know, this was very common. Uh, they were then floated down the river to the steamship, railhead, sawmill, whatever. Uh, then they were taken to a large lumber mill and uh, used for production if you didn't get them to one of these two-man things. There was a huge law mill in the town of Grandin, Missouri, down in the southeastern part of Missouri around uh, Eminence and Winona and this area south of there. Uh, at the little town of Grandin, so big that at its heyday, I think I've read where there were as many as 5,000 people living there working in the sawmill, the biggest sawmill in the country at that time. Uh, so here's, here's kind of a picture. Uh, this was all done by hand originally, and uh, if you were a single man, you could do it with an axe, but boy, I'll tell you what, it was hard work. Uh, it was preferred if you had a crosscut saw, and you can see the two guys there for crosscut saw, and they could saw down a tree pretty rapidly. You know, I mean, you could do that pretty fast. Uh, and then you had to hew out the railroad tie. Now, folks, this was a dangerous job. Over the right-hand uh, side. You would you would cut the log up into eight foot sections because that was what a standard railroad tie was was eight foot, and I believe the dimensions of railroad tie was eight by six by six. I think I'm not for sure. I've read this somewhere, but I can't recall right now. And they used a broad axe, and they would just they would literally just stand on the thing, just chopping the sides off. You talk about dangers. You had to be really careful because folks, if you missed and chopped your foot. You know, you're out in the middle of the woods. Uh, probably there wasn't a doctor for miles and miles and miles, if there even was one, let alone a hospital. Uh, if you get in your foot, if you don't kill yourself by bleeding to death, you're probably going to die of an infection. You know, that's just all there is to it. Dangerous job. And I'm sure there were just hundreds of people that probably died doing this job. Uh, and by the way, folks, they got paid a whole lot of money for this. They got paid at the top rate, 10 cents a tie. A good tie hacker could hack out about eight ties a day, 80 cents a day, you know, and I mean, just hard work. I mean, it was a, it was a tough job. Uh, they would then haul the ties or the logs out, usually horses or mules. 
Um, and again, this was, you know, they usually did this way back in remote areas. So they had to get them to a river or a, or a railroad or somewhere. You know, again, most of them floated them. You wanted to be near a river when you did this because you would float these logs and these ties down the river. And here's a log float uh, going on. And again, I'm going to show you a little film that shows you this, all this in, in its entirety. And it's so neat to watch it happening. Uh, here's an example of a tie float. You can see these have already been hewn in the ties. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, they just, you know, this, these things would stretch for miles. Uh, and they usually did it in the summer, early fall, because if you did it in this winter, obviously that's not good because the river might freeze up and the water would be too cold because, it, you know, you got to be in the water a lot. They'd end up taking them to a steam engine. Here's uh, the Ozarks Land uh, and uh, Wood Company down by Grandin. And it shows you getting ready to log up logs. And again, I'm going to show you a movie that shows you this whole process. And they'd eventually end up in a sawmill, like right here. So uh, the biggest company, you know, most people did this individually, but then you would want to sell them to a company. The biggest company in the state of Missouri was the Missouri Lumber and Mining Company. And it was located down in the southeastern part of the state. Uh, uh, it, it just came to dominate the timber industry by the 1900s. Uh, it was primarily owned by a lot of Eastern investors. They saw money to be made from, from railroad ties. And they would purchase large tracts of timber and then they would literally just clear cut it. I mean, they would cut everything down. Uh, they didn't worry about the environment. They didn't worry about anything because they thought it's going to last forever. Well, they almost ruined the land. And you can imagine the erosion that took place after you would cut the natural vegetation down. The rivers got polluted. The land uh, would wash off all the topsoil. It just, it almost ruined parts of the Ozarks. Uh, luckily, uh, it didn't, you know came back due to the efforts of people like Leo Dre. Uh, it's still in operation today, but now that company is very environmentally sound. They have to be, you know, uh, the laws are set up now where you can't just go in and start chopping things down like they do in Brazil, you know, where they're doing the same thing to the Amazon rainforest that we did to the Ozarks 120 years ago. They're just, they're running the Amazon rainforest. Uh, here is a uh, poster. Uh, advertising lumber, beaver dam soft pine from the Missouri Lumber Mining Company, Grandin, Missouri. And that kind of shows you the timber town back there in the background. And uh, this thing was huge. Like I said, it I think at its height, it, it had like 5,000 people living there, working on this big uh, sawmill and working in the related industries that were involved. It was huge. Now it doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, so quite interesting. Um, again, clear cutting just had a disastrous effect upon the economy, uh, forever altered the landscape in some parts of the country. Um, of course, you know, there were some advantages to clear cutting. People later on would clear cut the land to make pasture out of it. And now that's a big thing in this part of the Ozarks because a lot of, uh, a lot of people raise cattle. Uh, but back in this day, that wasn't very common uh, because you know, it wasn't easy to get cattle from here to anywhere else. And you could only eat so much beef. And most people didn't eat beef anyway. They ate pork. You know, they ate poultry. You know, um, again, here's an example of some of the clear cutting that went on. Just, you know, you can see these huge trees. Uh, you can't find trees like that anymore in the Ozarks. They just don't exist for the most part. Uh, luckily, luckily, there were some people that, jumped in and realized that things were were going bad. And Theodore Roosevelt, probably as much as any president of the United States, uh, dealt with conservation. He created a national forest system. And in 1908, uh, uh, the Ozark National Forest was created in Ozark, and pardon me, in, the Ar in Arkansas. And the Mark Twain National Forest was created in 1932. Uh, and both these uh, our federally owned land uh, that basically you have to have permission to log in them and mine in them or whatever. 
And today there's over 100,000 acres in the Mark Twain forest. And uh, it's restricted as to what you can do there. They replant over a million seedlings a year to repopulate trees. So, you know, there's definitely some effort going on. You might remember uh, back in the 1960s, there was people that wanted to dam up the current river, just like they had dammed up the White River and uh, some of the other rivers in the Ozarks. And people jumped in and said, no, we need to preserve this river. And so they created the National Rivers Act and made the current, the Jacks Fork and the 11 Point Rivers, the first national rivers in this nation. They are preserved by the national government. And it's so good. I mean, I've floated to Jacks Fork. I can't even begin to tell you how many times. And uh, I am so glad that they did this because it's a beautiful river. Uh, if you've been with me for this whole time, you might remember I took you on a virtual float trip way back there when we first started this, you know. So, along with all the timber that got lost, you started losing, and I've kind of messed up my slide here, so I'm going to put it all out there. Uh, we started losing the animals because once you cleared away the forest and the timber, the natural protection of the animals, they left or were killed off. Do you realize that in 1937, there were only 3,500 deer left in the state of Missouri? 3,500. Folks, they harvest a couple hundred thousand deer a year now in the state of Missouri. And you have to harvest them because if you didn't, they would be running up and down the streets biting people. <laughs> you know, I mean, you have to harvest them. There's so many of them. And I know a lot of people... They get upset when you talk about, you know, all the deer that are killed in the state of Missouri. And, uh, you know, I, I understand that. I don't have any desire to kill Bambi myself anymore. I used to be a hunter, but I don't hunt anymore. And it's not, I, but I don't think you have to do it. Uh, wild turkey, black bear, mountain lion, river otter, elk, wolves, they all lived in the Ozarks in the early 1900s. And they all basically disappeared. It was so bad that in 1937, the Missouri Conservation Commission was established and they established to provide control over the environment and the wildlife. They said, we have got to do something. We're running what brought people to the Ozarks to begin with. So they started restocking the rivers. They started building fishing hatcheries. They started hunting restrictions. They started uh, restoration of, of wildlife. Uh, repopulation and luckily the people of Missouri believed in this to the point that in 1975 they passed an eighth of a cent sales tax to support the conservation efforts. Folks, Missouri is probably the single leading state in conservation in the United States today. I don't know if you know that or not, but there are almost every conservation agency in the country comes to Missouri to look at us. We are we are the premier conservation state in terms of uh, organization of the Conservation Commission. It's it's just fantastic, and uh, I can't say enough good things about it. I, nobody likes paying taxes, me included, but I gladly pay my eighth of a cent sales tax when I go to buy something, knowing that that's going to go for conservation efforts in this state. And uh, today. Uh, we have just so much that we didn't have. For instance, they're now restoring elk to the state to the point that they actually had an elk hunt this last fall. Uh, they only allowed, I think, three to be killed, but there's a big elk restoration going on down around Eminence in the Yellington area, as you can see. And you can drive down there if you have the time and you're still mobile enough. And you can drive through and you can actually drive through this thing and actually see uh, the elk roaming free. And their desire someday is to uh, get the elk to the point where it's restored. I hope I don't think it'll ever be like the deer because frankly, uh, elk are a little bit harder to raise. But uh, by the way, I don't know if you've ever eaten any elk meat. It's delicious. <laughs> you know, I had a chance to eat some elk meat one time. And I mean, I'm telling you, it is really, really good stuff. You know, if you've never eaten any black bear, look at this. This is black bear sightings 
in 2020. You know, you used to be able to call the Conservation Commission and tell them, say, hey, there's a bear down in this area. And they say there are no bear in Missouri. Well, they finally gave up saying that because they know there's too, many, too much evidence. I've seen bear in the wild in Missouri. Um, I personally was on a trip not too long ago, south of here a few miles, when a bear went roaming around a field. So it's there. Look at, look at this map. You'll notice that Christian County, I'm about right here. Christian County, right to the south of me, has the largest bear sightings of any, any county in the state of Missouri. But they're just, you know, all over the southern part of the Ozarks. Uh, you're down here in McDonald County. Uh, up here is Donna, where you're living, I believe, <laughs> you know. Jasper County, Newton County, in this area. Uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of bear sightings. Um, and you can go on down here, you can go up here, Jefferson County, south of St. Louis, up around the Lake of the Ozarks. There's just lots and lots of bear sightings going on. Uh, there's mountain lion in the Ozarks, folks. I know, again, up until just a couple of years ago, the Conservation Commission would tell you there are no mountain lions in the state of Missouri. Well, I'm here to tell you there are mountain lions in the state of Missouri. Uh, there's probably the next thing that's going to be here, and they're probably already here, are wolves. Uh, there is a wolf restoration movement going on, and I'm not for sure how that's going to go over, <laughs> you know, uh, with the cattle industry. I'm not for sure the wolf restoration movement is going to be um, as successful as has been the bear and the mountain lion and the elk restoration. I'm afraid that one may not quite go over as well because wolves are pretty predatory and they run in packs and uh when these people start losing herds of cattle i'm afraid there may be a little feedback on that one you know but anyway that's getting to it now i've got to show you about a 15 minute film here what this film is this was a movie that was made i believe in 1920 i believe that's what it said uh and it was made to document the logging industry in the state of Missouri. And it was lost. And then as they were going through some files, they found it uh, and they gave it to the Conservation Commission and they put music to it and narration. And I love the film. It's a silent movie, but it's got music and narration. I hope you can hear that. Uh, but I love it because you can see these guys working. And folks, it's amazing to me. You should watch these little old skinny hillbilly guys picking up a railroad tie on their shoulder, carrying them around. These things weigh two and 300 pounds a piece. I don't know if you've ever lifted a railroad tie. They are heavy. They are heavy. Uh, I used to challenge my football players after I would show this movie in class when I taught high school. And I told them, I said, go out here and try to do this all day long. Go out here and try to do it one time. And I had some of them come back and said, man, how did they do that? How did those little guys do that? Folks, they were just tougher than we were. That's all there is to it. They were better men than we were. I couldn't do it. I know that. So, so let's watch this and uh, hope you'll enjoy it. Missouri's great forests cover about a third of the state, mainly in the Ozarks. The character of this land, its wildlife, its recreation, its water and wood resources, depends on the trees. It's been that way for more than a century. Though the rivers flow quietly through wooded hills today, they were the sites of great activity in the early 1900s. Railroad ties and lumber produced in this region helped develop the nation. The old motion picture footage that followed was taken in the 1920s and gives us a rare look at a fascinating part of the Ozarks past when forests covered two thirds of the state. This is the story of the railroad cross tie from tree to track. 
All of the operations shown are of and by the T.J. Moss Tie Company of St. Louis that was founded in 1879. In 1888, the company was the largest supplier of railroad ties in Missouri. It was acquired by Kerr McGee Corporation in 1963. Its operations continue today. Working this virgin timber into lumber and ties put cash money into the Ozark economy. Without the logging industry, economic development of this region probably would have been greatly delayed. It all began with the felling of the tree. A logger cut a notch on the side toward which he wanted the tree to fall. The cut was then completed with a two-man crosscut saw. It was a dangerous process. Trees could fall in an unexpected direction or spring back when they hit the ground. After the tree was down, limbs and branches were removed and the log cut into eight foot lengths, since eight foot was the standard length of a railroad cross tie. Red and white oak were the preferred species, but other hardwoods were also used. Cross ties were manufactured by one of two methods either by hand hewing or by sawing. A person who hewed ties was called a tie hacker. He stood on top of the log and scored along its edges at intervals of four to eight inches. The scores, or juggles as they were called, were popped out and the faces hewn down to the desired width and smoothness with a broad ax. With larger logs, a hacker could obtain two ties by splitting the log with a broad axe and iron wedges. Ties were not considered well hewn if the score marks were more than half an inch deep or the surfaces were uneven. After the two ties were split, the fourth side of the tie was smooth with a broad axe. It took about an hour to hew a tie. Hackers earned 10 cents for each tie produced. A good hacker on an average day could complete about eight ties. Many farmers were able to earn extra money during the winter by hewing ties. The company had 40 sawmills operating on a 36,000 acre tract in Reynolds County. Logs were brought in from the woods on wagons pulled by teams of mules. At the sawmill, the logs were unloaded and stacked into log decks to await processing. The men used cant hooks to move the logs. The hook on the long handle gave them the leverage to roll large logs. Unlike other lumber companies in the area, which had one large sawmill, the T.J. Moss Company had many small mills. Those mills helped them cut the costs of building miles of cram lines that would have been needed to haul logs through a centralized location. Most of the logs were made into cross ties, but some would be sawn into grade lumber and flooring as well. An expert sawyer was the key to a profitable sawmill. The sawyer determined how the log would be cut to obtain the highest grade of lumber. He's the man on the left controlling the movement of the log carriage. The man riding the carriage is the block setter. Through a system of hand signals, the sawyer told the block setter how far to advance the log. One finger meant one inch, two fingers, two inches, and so on. Actually, it was a little more complicated than that. Since the saw blade was one quarter inch thick, the block setter had to allow for the saw curve. So to cut a one inch board, the log was advanced an inch and a quarter. Usually several sawing operations were taking place at the same time. The men in the background are running an edger which cut the lumber to various widths, while others would cut it to different lengths. The cross ties and lumber were separated as they came out of the mill. 
pies were rolled into one pile, lumber into another. Pies were loaded onto wagons and hauled to the river bank and allowed to air dry for about a year, so they float in the river dry. Lumber was stacked with thin strips of wood separating the layers to speed drying and help prevent decay. The sawmills were located far from railroads, making transportation of the cross ties to the treating plant difficult. The easiest way to move them was by a river drive. Ties were thrown into the small creeks in the headwaters of the rivers and floated downstream to a railroad crossing. The company made the first river drive on the Black River in 1908, and the last one tied up at Clearwater in September 1926. During that time period, ties were floating on some part of the river at all times. The drives began far up the east, middle, and west forks of the Black River, and more ties were added as the raft moved downstream some 30 to 40 miles to the Missouri Pacific Railroad siding at Clearwater. The drive started about the 1st of June each year. Some of the larger drives contained more than 250,000 ties and took four months to complete. Usually only a mile or two of progress was made each day. The river hogs, or pigs as they were called, worked a 10-hour shift and were paid $1.75 a day plus meals. The men worked ate and slept along the river while on a drive, and were wet to the skin most of the time. When the drive reached the railroad crossing, men, teams of horses and mules, and wagons would be standing by to pull the ties from the river and carry them to waiting railroad cars. A tie boom, constructed of pilings, wooden timbers, and heavy steel cable, was stretched across the river to stop the ties at the takeout point. About a quarter mile above the boom, Wagons were backed into the river for loading ties. Each wagon held 20 to 25 ties. For this particular operation, the company had 40 to 50 teams hauling ties. Many of the teamsters were independent operators. They supplied their own equipment and teams. Mules were preferred over horses because they could handle the heat of the summer and were less excited. Their loads were counted and the men were paid according to the amount of ties they fall to the rail cars. Gangs of men called shoulder crews loaded the cars. Two men called headers picked up a tie and placed it on a cushioned leather shoulder pad of the carriage. Some of the ties weighed several hundred pounds. Box cars had to be loaded by hand. The springy oak planks looked precarious, but they actually made the loading easier as they bounced the man and his tie up into the car. Each man loaded, on the average, about 200 of the heavy water-soaked ties a day. The ties were pulled from the river with either a chain-driven conveyor or a steam-powered Barnhart loader. The loader could pull ties directly from the river and swing them into awaiting rail cars. Even though the mechanized loaders were being used more, there still was a tremendous amount of manual labor involved in retrieving ties and loading them for shipment to the treating plants. The work was slow, and when the main drive came in, ties could be backed up the river for miles. After 1925, P.J. Moss and other tie producing companies working in the Ozarks agreed to a plan that would help protect fish spawning by halting tie rafting operations during the period from April 15th through June 1st. There was concern that the tie drives disrupted spawning. The railroad brought the loading crews in daily from faraway communities to the work site and returned them at day's end. There were no accommodations for them to stay the night.
Well, that's about all I'm going to be able to show because we're going to have to stop here in a minute. It's, it's, it's about done anyway. But uh, Donna, could you guys hear a sound on that? Could you hear the sound? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, we could hear the sound. Great, great. Okay. Uh, well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know. I don't know which one would be the worst job, the river hog, uh, standing in water all day long, carrying those railroad ties on your shoulder. Uh, you Our power a, just amazed I, at that. <clears throat> oh, I'm telling you, they were better men than me. That's all yeah. there is to it. <laughs> you know? I bet they didn't live long with that working that hard. I, probably 60 years at the most. Oh, I uh, bet they lived that long. You don't think <clears throat> so? Oh. I, I had a few tie hackers in my ancestry, and they didn't live very long. I'll be honest with you. What are you saying? Tie, T-I-E what? Tie hacker. H-A-C-K-E-R. Oh, oh tie. tie hacking. You know, that's what it was called. They hacked out a railroad tie. Well, next week, we're going to talk about mining. We're particularly going to talk about Joplin, which, uh, you know, quite a you know quite a center of the mining industry and so we're going to visit with the uh with the lead mining industry uh which made joplin and carthage and uh web city all of these towns uh you know really got their start as a result of the mining industry down in that area so that's what we're going to talk about next week and then the next two weeks after that we're going to look at the life of the daily ozarker how did they live uh, and it, I think you'll find that really interesting because we're going to talk about some of the superstitions and some of the uh, uh, things like that. So I think you'll enjoy that part of it a lot. So I hope you enjoyed it today. Uh, I've enjoyed talking about it and we will see you next week. Okay. Very interesting. Thank yes. You. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.